Hello, welcome everyone to Inside the Birds TV with Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan presented by DraftKings. We've got a big Sunday night showdown to preview. Eagles taking on the Dallas Cowboys. Always exciting. It's going to be at the link. And we're excited to have a real expert help us break down the game. Please, please welcome longtime Cowboys reporter. He works for ESPN. He's also co-host of the Doomsday podcast with Matt Mosley, who is recovering as we hear. So our best to Matt Mosley. Ed, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, before we talk with you, uh, do you, do you want to report? A lot of our listeners know the the personalities. Can you give us a thumbs up on uh, on Matt right now? Yeah, Matt Mosley was uh, injured seriously in a, a bicycle accident at White Rock Lake about three weeks ago, and this week underwent surgery uh, to fuse uh, a spinal fracture in his uh, upper neck. Uh, but he does have full use of his extremities. Uh, cool. He's expected to be released from the hospital in the next 48 hours and uh, begin physical therapy and finish his recovery at home. And I'm kind of the last man standing on the Doomsday podcast because we also lost our producer, Mark Frito Friedman, who's been in the hospital for three months, I think, um, and was in very serious uh, condition, as you can imagine, being in an, in an, in an ICU for as long as, as he was. Uh, mm-hmm. test, had COVID symptoms, but has never tested positive for COVID. But it mm-hmm. looks like he's going to survive as well, and he's begun his uh, recovery. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that is, that is great news. A lot of people from our area remember Matt from just, you know, being one of the original ESPN.com's bloggers and uh, hash marks, I think, was his column. So we obviously wish him the best. Uh, wish you and Matt the best. And you can catch the Doomsday podcast, I know, on all major podcast platforms. All right, before we get into the game, I want to tell our listeners to download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app today and use code ITB for a special offer when you sign up. That's code ITB for a special offer when you sign up. All right, well, um, I think before the year started, Ed, people thought Eagles-Cowboys are going to be in it for the division. And lo and behold, they are. It's just that each team only has two wins. So it's like being half right and half wrong. But it sounds like just from – our vantage point, a lot of a mess going on in Dallas. How would you describe everything going on right now with the Cowboys? Well, there's always a lot going on with the Cowboys, as we know. I mean, one of the reasons I've spent 30 years in Dallas as a journalist is because when all else fails, I have Jerry's football circus in my backyard. And that's that's what it continues to be. Um, Obviously, this is not the season that they expected to have. They they hired Mike McCarthy, um, who's the first experienced head coach Jerry Jones has ever hired with expertise on the offensive side of the ball. And I think that showed up early in the season when they uh, had most of their regular starters. And certainly when they had Dak Prescott, uh, who was on his way to a record historic season by NFL standards, not franchise quarterback standards, um, but was playing on the franchise tag. You know, it seemed like McCarthy moved them into uh, more of a pass first type of approach Don't know if that might have been distorted by how bad they were on defense and these huge leads that they were trying to chase down every week. But regardless, Dak Prescott was having a remarkable season. And I think when he went down uh, with that fractured and dislocated ankle, I kind of think my sense is that the Cowboys players kind of lost hope at that point. I think they, they recognized that the one guy that they were most accountable to and the guy who could overcome any of their deficiencies, and there were a lot of them, was not going to play again. And that meant for the majority of the players recognition that they weren't going to achieve their goals this season. But obviously they, they didn't expect this to happen. McCarthy, like I said, was hired because they thought, I mean, talking to Stephen Jones right after the, the introductory press conference, you know, talked about McCarthy was going to bring, you know, a different culture and uh, accountability. He was a program builder. He could sustain success. I mean, he did. He he went to the playoffs nine times in 13 years in Green Bay. He won a Super Bowl. And now you look back at it and and you wonder, well, was all of that a function of having two of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of the game in in Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers? Maybe they did the same thing in Green Bay that Dak Prescott was doing here. And let's turn our attention to the defensive side of the football. And I know that they've certainly had some injuries on that side, but – They've been almost historically bad. We, I had one team tell me they look almost non-competitive on defense. What has been the problem? Why are they so bad on that side of the football? Well, I mean, they, they didn't really address their secondary you know, situation. They lost Byron Jones in free agency. Um, he was their best cover corner by far. Uh, got a lucrative contract from the Dolphins without really any significant competition uh, from the Cowboys to retain him. 
So I think there's a sense that in the organization here that the Cowboys, you know, make big commitments to offense and not to defense. I think their vision for this team was, you know, we're going to, we're going to come out, we're going to be the Kansas city chiefs. You know, we're going to, we're going to be great on offense. We're going to dominate on offense. We're going to get early leads and then we're going to turn loose all these pass rushers that, that we've signed, you know, Everson Griffin on a one year deal. Um, Alden Smith on a one-year deal in his return to the NFL. Uh, Demarcus Lawrence, the high, richest cowboy in, in franchise history on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and none of that materialized. They're always playing from behind. They can't stop the run. Um, they've been horrific against – I mean, one week <laughs> they went to Seattle and they gave up five touchdown passes to Russell Wilson. And it should have been six because D.K. Metcalf got the ball punched out, showboating on the two-yard line. The guy who now is symbolic of oh, the ultimate hustle play in the NFL was <laughs> yeah. showboating and got the ball punched out of the end zone, or else it's six <laughs> touchdown passes for Russell Wilson. And the next week they gave up 300 rushing yards to the Browns. So they can't stop anything. Um, and, and part of it's probably injury-related, but and this week they're, they're expecting to get back Cheeto Wouzier, who's the starting cornerback. Nobody ever thought he was a solution to any defensive problem. Uh, Sean Lee may come back. I think he would – be a significant return because he can hold people accountable. He can make adjustments, smart leadership guy, playmaker, knows how to read things out. Um, but man, I mean, there have been a lot of instances when people put on the tape and you just see guys not hustling, you know, uh, and they've been called out about that three or four times during the course of the year. And, and it still persists. And mm -hmm. so I think you begin to wonder, well, Mike Nolan, a lot of people have thought since week two that, that he should be fired. And if you look at his history, I mean, he's coached defense in the NFL for a long time, 30-plus years in the NFL, eight different franchises, but he hasn't called defenses in six years. And Mike McCarthy's expertise is not on that side of the ball, as I mentioned previously. And, you know, in Green Bay, he let Dom Capers uh, have complete autonomy on that side of the ball. I've checked with people in Green Bay. said McCarthy had nothing to do with their defense. And so he doesn't have any solutions for what's going on either. And he obviously uh, hired Nolan. Uh, Nolan gave McCarthy his first job in the NFL in San Francisco in 2006. Uh, and I kind of think he was a compromise candidate mm. for the defensive coordinator role because in that year, McCarthy was off and spending his time in the Green Bay farmhouse with a handful of assistant coaches breaking down tape and putting together ideas for when they return. The guy who was a defensive coordinator, presumptive defensive coordinator, was Jim Haslett. Uh, and Jim Hazlitt's son is on McCarthy's staff, hmm. but Hazlitt's not on McCarthy's staff, as I believe he intended. So I don't know if he was not acceptable to Jerry and Stephen Jones and the compromise candidate was Mike Nolan. Um, but that's kind of where they are. I mean, this week they released three defensive players who have been starting. <laughs> um, that's how bad. And I think it sends a good message, kind of belatedly. I mean, last year Jason Garrett stuck with Brett Maher, the kicker, uh, when he had cost him like five or six games, it was late in the season when they finally made that change and it was too late. Uh, so I don't know that this is going to make a significant difference, but it sends the right message. And tell us about Ben DiNucci. It looks like he uh, might get the start there for the Cowboys on Sunday night. Uh, and what led the Cowboys to drafting him in the seventh round, what they saw out of him? Yeah. Uh, when Mike McCarthy came to the franchise, his plan for the quarterback position was to retain Dak Prescott, obviously as a starting quarterback and obviously build the entire offense around him and play through the quarterback position. Um, he also wanted to sign a veteran backup, something the Cowboys had not always been committed to doing. And so they signed Andy Dalton when they had the opportunity. And then he wanted to draft a quarterback, something the Cowboys have done less of than any team uh, in the NFL. I think this, I think Deducci is our fifth, the fifth quarterback that they've drafted. They drafted him in the seventh round out of James Madison. After they chose him, McCarthy compared him uh, to Mark Bulger, uh, the diminutive uh, record-setting quarterback who replaced Kurt Warner. Um, Mike, McCar Mike Martz's decision to replace Kurt Warner prematurely, I think most people thought at the time. Uh, and Bulger had quite a bit of success, but obviously a smaller guy, but an athletic guy with a live arm. Uh, but, you know, he seems to be wildly overmatched in this game. Uh, the Cowboys have started 13 rookie quarterbacks in the history of the franchise, and mm -hmm. three of them won their first game. Um, and, and those would be Roger Staubach, Kevin Sweeney, <laughs> and, of course, here's the name that keeps showing up this year, Jason Garrett. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, Danucci's trying to become the fourth rookie Cowboys starter, presuming that he does start 
on uh, Sunday night, as I would expect. He's gotten all the practice reps this week, and Andy Dalton still has not cleared the concussion protocol as we tape this on uh, Friday. Ed, you've covered Jerry Jones, I guess, almost four decades, right, since the late 80s, something like that. So how do you think he's handling this awful start? They were not expecting this. How do you think he's handling it from a guy you, you've covered him for so long? How do you think he's going to handle this so far and then going forward if this continues? Well, I think, that, I think the question that has been on a lot of people's minds and really became prominent after how poorly they played in Washington and losing to a one-win team and being dominated the way they were by a one-win team in their own division. Like, say whatever you want about Jason Garrett. He, didn't, he obviously presided over – the worst decade in the history of the Cowboys franchise. And oh, they've been playing football for 60 years in Dallas. But in terms of playoff appearances, the three that they had in the decade he coached the team is the fewest they've ever had in any single decade. Mm. Um, but at least, at least he won in the NFC East. He beat the bad teams that they knew the best. And that hasn't been the case for this. They're lucky to beat the Giants. You know, they should really be winless. The only two games they've won were home games against winless opponents, and they did it on the final play of the game uh, with a game-winning Greg Zerline field goal. Um, but I, I, so I don't think that Mike McCarthy is going to be a one-and-done coach. And the reason I believe that is, first of all, Jerry Jones is obviously very sensitive to any criticism, <laughs> much less an admission that he's a poor general manager. Like, he still isn't over the whole Jimmy Jerry thing from 1989 when I first came here. Uh, he's still very protective of his, his identity in that regard. He wants to be respected and have credibility as a general manager, even when nobody gives him that. Um, so I don't see him doing it because he would have to admit he made a huge mistake in evaluating something as important as hiring a head coach. Um, I also uh, don't think that Jerry has ever believed in paying or has seldom believed in paying head coach is big money. There have been a couple of exceptions when he's been really desperate. Um, but generally, that's been his philosophy. So is he really in a year where the pandemic has cost owners so much profitability because there aren't, you know, fans at games? Um, is he really going to take on basically the financial burden of paying two entire coaching staffs? Like, he's going to fire McCarthy with four years left on his deal and all of his staff and hire a new head coach and staff. So he's going to basically play two coaching staffs for four years I just don't see that. I see Jerry making the argument that, hey, we lost our franchise quarterback. We were doing some great things on offense with him. We lost a lot of, you know, two, three members of our starting offensive line. It was just too much for anybody to overcome. And then the coaches had the disadvantages of, you know, losing everything you're supposed to gain as a first-year coaching staff in an off season that was unlike any other in the history of football because of the pandemic. So that's, that's how I see Jerry rationalizing it. And, and he'll do it in large measure – even if he thinks McCarthy, they hire the wrong guy, I don't think he's going to be ready to admit it this soon. And a uh, big game for wide receivers on Sunday night. The Eagles are getting Jalen Rager back. We'll see how much he plays. He's someone from that Dallas uh, Metroplex area. I heard the Cowboys had liked him too going into the draft, but obviously C.D. Lamb uh, fell into their lap. How has Lamb performed, and what is the perception in that area of Jalen Rager from his college career and, and going into the first round? Well, I, I think Jalen was regarded as an explosive playmaker um, whose numbers were tainted by the fact he never really played with a very good quarterback. Uh, obviously, that wasn't the case for C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb played with two Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks at, at Oklahoma. Um, Lamb has, until last week in Washington, uh, been a terrific addition to uh, the Cowboys offense. Um, in fact, for most of the season, he was leading all receivers in terms of performance out of the slot. Um, both in yards and, and, uh, and receptions. But last week, they made him – Mike McCarthy uh, designates captains of each group uh, on a weekly basis rather than uh, doing it at the beginning of the year and having that person serve that role for the year as a leadership figure. He does it on a weekly basis as a reward for performance. And so they made C.D. Lamb, a rookie, the captain last week, and then he had five balls targeted – he was targeted five times in the game, uh, caught no balls – I had at least two, two drops and arguably three, <laughs> including one in the end zone where he had his hands on the ball and didn't make the play. So not his best performance. But I thought it was interesting that Michael Gallup told a story this week about how he went up to C.D. Lamb on the sideline during the game and, and sort of tried to bolster his confidence by saying, hey, when's the last time you had a bad game? 
and he said CD couldn't answer. He couldn't remember having a bad game, and so he said, "I think you'll be, I think you'll be back next week." But let's see. Now he's playing with a rookie quarterback, right? Ed, when when you look at this offense, and and obviously we're talking about the quarterback position, how bad could this thing get if Dalton's not? We obviously right this week it doesn't look very good. Could this team be a a three and thirteen, four and twelve type team here? Could it be that bad, or is it just because they're they're so injured? That's why they they have the record that they have. Uh, I so you said three and thirteen or four and twelve. I, so I assume you're eliminating that they're going to lose the rest of their games as a possibility because well, no look, Cowboys. Oh yeah, no, so you no, say no, they no, might not win. Okay. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no <laughs> Cowboys team has ever finished two and fourteen. This could be the first. They've never. Well, well are they? they that's got. my question. Though. Are they? Is, is it just because mm-hmm. with Philly, a lot of it's injury related, and you, you were talking about their injuries. But did they miss some of these draft picks? We, we might as well get into that. Now, Lamb is, is very gifted. But what, what, why have they underachieved for years? You talked about Jason Garrett. Is it just coaching, or has the draft not been good enough? Um, actually, I, I think that they, their personnel people – by the way, they, they could lose the rest of their games. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, they're not favored in any of the rest of their games, including oh a home Thanksgiving Day game against Washington. Um, but anyway – uh, I, I think the, the bigger issue with this team has been they signed – they did a poor job evaluating veteran free agency, right? They just released Donatari Poe. They released Daryl Worley. Um, they traded Everson Griffin, uh, which is a kind of wave the white towel uh, move. I think most people see it that way. He was marginally productive, certainly didn't have the impact that we all expected when he came here given his history in Minnesota. Um, so I think they evaluated that part uh, of putting a team together poorly this year, which has been unusual because really Will McClay, their personnel director, generally is, has been exceptional in that regard. Mm-hmm. But they, they didn't do it well this year. And to have that and then combine it with the injur- injuries that they've had to significant starting players, I mean, then you get a sense of how big the hole in this roster really is. Um, but the draft, I, I, would, I would argue they, they, they did pretty well. I mean, you could make the – an argument that maybe they should have drafted a defensive player instead of C.D. Lamb. Um, but, I mean, they had it going on offense, and that's, they're obviously that's the direction the league is going on offense is to throw the football. And, and to have Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup and, and C.D. Lamb is, is, you could argue it's a luxury. Pretty but they felt, again, like they could, they could outscore people, um, like the Chiefs do, and just be average on defense. Um, but, so then they drafted uh, um, Trayvon Diggs who started at corner every week of the season. Now he's been beat, um, but he's from Alabama. He's a lanky guy. He's a competitive guy. He gets beat because he's a rookie and he doesn't really know what he's doing. And you can argue he's further victimized by playing in this poor defensive scheme and the fact that their front doesn't get any pressure. But I think he's looked like he's going to be a good player eventually. Uh, and then they drafted uh, Tyler Biadosh, who's been starting at center since Joe Looney got injured. And Travis Frederick retired in the offseason. Um, now guys like uh, Nelville Gallimore are going to get more playing time since Poe uh, has been exiled. And we'll see how he does. But I think generally – and now you have Danucci potentially starting. So I think they've gotten some impact players and some quality starts out of their rookie class. It's, the disaster has really come uh, in their evaluation of the veteran free mm-hmm. agents that they added to the team. Thank you. I now know how to correctly pronounce the center's name. It's Biadash. I wasn't exactly Biedash. sure. Biadash. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Got Pretty it. good for a center. Um, last one, Ed, and, and I can't believe we've gone 20 minutes into an Eagles kind of Cowboys preview, and we have not mentioned Ezekiel Elliott. He used to tear the Eagles apart five straight games at one point of over 100 <laughs> yards, but he's putting the ball on the ground. He looks a little bit like not into it. Um has this, is this becoming a problem with, with how he's just kind of carrying himself and along with the, the low production? Well, obviously, he's, he's made the most money of any running back uh, in history in terms of uh, guarantees uh, a year ago at this time. Um, and he hasn't, he hasn't played up to it. And I mentioned McCarthy and, and his history of playing through the quarterback. Well, this organization, in, in, its, in its recent uh, vision, was constructed around the offensive line and the running back. Um, and – that's not the way Mike McCarthy's played. And so I raised the question before the season started, hey, I want to see what role Ezekiel Elliott plays in mm-hmm. this offense because I suspect it's not going to be what we're used to. And to this point, it hasn't been that. Um, he, he hasn't had a 100-yard rushing game yet under Mike mm-hmm. McCarthy. 
He's a two-time NFL rushing champion. He hasn't had a 100-yard rushing game yet, the longest streak of his career. Uh, in fact, the last two weeks, he hasn't even had 50 yards, which is the longest streak of his career. And the last two weeks, quite honestly, once McCarthy lost Prescott, he, he made a very uh, strategic and purposeful decision to emphasize Elliott, create a play-action passing game to protect his quarterback. And like you said, it's been a disaster. He's fumbled more times than anybody in football. You know, they go to him against Arizona. He turns it over on back-to-back -back touches. He's the only player to do that all year long. And it leads to, you know, 14 points. And now they're playing from behind. Now they can't play the way they wanted to play. Mm. And then last mm. week in Washington, they throw him a ball over the middle, in the middle of the field. And it wasn't a perfectly thrown ball by Andy Dalton. But, you know, Zeke deflected it and it got intercepted. So he's had a hand in three turnovers the last two weeks. And he hasn't created – uh, the running, rushing yardage that they expect and need if they're going to succeed with their backup quarterbacks the rest of the year. But, yeah, uh, and, I, and I have talked to general managers and asked, hey, what's your opinion from what you see of this guy? And, and somebody used the exact phrase you did, which, hey, you know what, sometimes he just doesn't look that into it. And mm. I, I always regarded Zeke as the most ferocious competitor on their team other than Dak. Mm -hmm. um, but – that's not what we're seeing on a regular basis right now. And you're right about his success against the Eagles. In fact, I think he has the highest average uh, in terms of average yards in a game against any particular opponent in the history of the game. His average against the Eagles is the highest of anybody in the history of the game. And I'm talking about Walter Payton and mm. Jim Brown. Those are the guys who are now behind him on that wow. list. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> well, it all, it all really sets up to be one interesting clash if I can call it that. I don't know if I'll call it a clash of titans, clash of but I'll call it a, a clash of <laughs> NFC East rivals on Sunday night. Ed, thanks so much for coming on and breaking down the game with us, and uh, maybe we'll do it again uh, when, when it's at your place uh, in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Put me down for that. I'll try and be right. shorter with my answers so you can ask more questions. Good stuff. No, no, no. Good You're stuff. perfect. Good You're stuff. perfect. We just asked the questions, and you did a great job of uh, putting it all in perspective for us. So please give our best also to Matt Mosley and uh, – Everybody should look forward to the Doomsday Podcast. It's on uh, every podcast platform. And, of course, you can see Ed all the time on ESPN. want to thank you all for watching this edition of ITB TV. We'll catch you all on the next episode. Have a good weekend, everybody.